Space. The final frontier. Well, okay, not, not really. All right, uh, take two, take two. Here in the Mitten State, welcome to Code 47, bringing you all things Star Trek. Spanning the quadrants, the best thing since the neutral zone. All right, back again with episode 130 of the Code 47 podcast on the Secret Friends Unite Podcasting Network. I am your host, Trek Lord of West Michigan, your humble servant, Charlie Carden, joined as always by the guy, my uh, my wingman on this Star Trek journey for three whole years now, just about, oh, Mr. Yeah. Peter Stein. Yeah, I know, right? Show's been around. It'll be four years uh, this September. And uh, as I've mentioned before, I, I've had a shifting uh, period of different hosts. Uh, Aaron has been our most recent, most consistent host, but he's got a very busy life, so he's just with us here and there. But Peter's my guy. Peter's my guy. So I'm grateful for Peter. How are you this morning? I'm doing all right. Glug, glug, glug. That's what I like to hear. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, we are back with an action packed show. Uh, San Diego Comic Con happened since the last time we recorded. There was mm -hmm. a Star Trek panel, and oh my goodness, a lot going on on that it, Star Trek panel. There's a bunch of stuff that happened. <laughs> you bet. So we've got a pretty robust news section. Uh, we're going to slide into talking about three episodes of Star Trek Prodigy, uh, and then we're going to keep talking about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So, but before we do that, uh, the butcher bill comes due, as a Le as a Leah Dama once said in an episode of Battlestar Galactica. Hell of a butcher's bill, Chief. We do talk, but no, this is a pleasant one because we're talking about our Patreon, some absolutely awesome folks uh, that contribute to us financially uh, and spiritually, as it were. So it gives us the opportunity to make additional content, uh, push out uh, ad-free content, early content like this show always comes out 24 hours uh, on the earlier on the patreon than it does uh on the regular feed so we are grateful for that um those folks were we added a little bonus shout out tier going forward our besties uh is uh chris one h one d who's a guy who was just on our exclusive uh patreon uh, chat with us earlier this week super fun guy who's guest with us a bunch derek trevilian who is my figure collecting partner here in uh here in uh, the grand rapids area and then we get into some folks I don't necessarily know personally, but we have Francie, XEP, and my Uncle Tim, which Todd wrote Charlie's Uncle Tim, and I put in his last name as Haran, uh, who is, is very cute. He gave me a check for $24 last year. He said, I'd like to support you. So I signed up myself. So now I'm a Patreon. We're Patreons together. It's wonderful. Nice. Um, <laughs> our, our, our nice regular folks uh, on our Friends with Benefits level, which I talk about all the time, is John Sedorf, the awesome Phoenix Sisters Entertainment, a uh, friend of the show, uh, Kelly Gentner up there in Wisconsin, and her partner, Crayley, Brendan Myers, Corey and HD and Matthew Keel and our superstar folks are the BFFs, the wonderful, nice family of the Twin Cities. Uh, Sean was on our Patreon cast earlier this week. It was my first chance to really meet him. But his nice. kids are Stella and Henry. They always get the great shout out. So we're very grateful uh, for them. Again, mm -hmm. if you'd like to visit patreon.com slash Secret Friends Unite, try us out for seven days. Uh, see if you enjoy the bonus stuff that we produce. Peter and I do a great show uh, recently uh, called The Facts Geek Life, where myself and a frequent collaborator collaborator like peter uh take a genre show we take a season and break down a number of episodes we are just uh hitting the midway point of talking about ron moore's battlestar galactica peter and i and it's been fantastic so it's a uh, trip. <laughs> it is a trip but a lot of other uh great bonus stuff on there uh like a comic book based show that i do with todd oxford my main partner called the spinner rack which airs on alternate week so yeah pop on over there again patreon.com slash secret friends unite Try us for seven days, and if you like it, stick it on. All right. Okay. Uh, on with, off with paying the bills. And now to talk about the news. My God, San Diego Comic-Con was now just a couple weeks, but not even a couple weeks past. There was a Star Trek panel where we got four big things that I've highlighted. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name them, and then we don't have to go through them every single tiny little bit, but I'll name them. I'll let Peter do the And then we a mini one, which is hilarious. Yes, exa exactly correct. Uh, we had a five-minute uh, sneak peek of what I'm guessing is going to be the season premiere of Star Trek Strange New World. If it follows their normal pattern, probably. Yeah. Now, we do not have a date yet for that, uh, but due to the writer strike, I would not be surprised if that nudges its way into 2025. But you know what? That's okay. 
uh, because we do have something. I'm going to jump ahead in my notes here. We do have something confirmed for October, the fifth and final season of Lower Decks. There's a lot of people griping about it. Oh, God, how could it end this and that? Look, all things end. Five five seasons is a great run of anything these days. It's one at one season longer than Enterprise. And exactly. Two longer than the original. So, you know. Exactly correct. I have a personal stake in Lower Decks because I've met several of the actors, and they're wonderful people. I love, love Eugene, who he spent some time with on the cruise. Same thing with Tawny. Um, just great folks. Uh, the, a teaser for some section. Point. Yeah. <laughs> some yeah, point. I'll meet him. <laughs> you'll do. You will. I promise. A uh, teaser for the section uh, 31 Star Trek's first TV movie, uh, which we'll be getting again in an undesignated, undesignated time. Even but though we had one that was a theatrical release that had the special effects of a TV movie. Yes. <laughs> Star Trek V? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, oh, boy. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we did get some great new cast members for the Starfleet Academy show, which I believe is going into production kind of as we speak. I know they were yep, away. It's short. If, if not next week, it's shortly. Absolutely. So, Peter, jump in. What? Which one of these four things that you heard about has you the most excited? Uh, the thing that has me the most excited is Lower Decks. Um, I have been unabashedly a fan of Lower Decks. I know that it's silly. I know that it's not it for everybody. But I love the fact that this show is goofy, but also really, really loves the universe that it's in and loves right. to make fun of it. It right. em- embraces the camp of Star Trek. And yeah. it's so much fun. Big, big time. No no doubt about it. Um, I, I detected a little bit of a vibe that maybe Section 31 kind of wasn't for you. Were you not feeling it? No. no. I, okay. S- Tell me about that. Um, I mean, I've never, I mean, everyone who's listened knows I'm not the biggest discovery fan anyway. Yeah. Um, and so we're bringing a character that I, I don't like discovery's take on the mirror universe. It was, it's, a, it's, it's, I, it's way over. It's, it's a little bit, it's yeah. not the same as like the, uh, the older takes. Yeah. Um, but, um, and so as much as I like, um, why can't I remember her name? You're thinking of Michelle Yeoh. Michelle Yeoh. As much as yeah. I like Michelle Yeoh as an actress, like she's phenomenal. Oh my god! Yes, I, I don't really like Georgia as a character. Not the Mirror Universe one. I really liked her when she was the the, the captain. The, yeah, the Captain her, Georgia. Her, yeah, her and, brief spin. Yeah, her brief version of like the Prime Universe good character. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really care for this character, even with like the character development. Like she's been better but i still don't like her so it's one of those like i'm not really too keen on having a film that's focused on this character firstly yeah and secondly, this one this movie really felt um tone deaf <laughs> um in the sense that it's 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 trying to be the suicide squad mm-hmm. um and it's like oh we're bad guys and we're gonna go do f- fantastical things and it's like section 31 is a clandestine organization that does the dirty things that no one wants to do but they still see themselves as good guys right so it seems to be like there's a there's a there's a miss here yeah and it took it to an absurd direction when section 31 was featured very prominently in season two of discovery because yeah. they took it you know the the organization that has existed throughout three programs we got it in ds9 we jumped back to enterprise where we saw them a couple of times with a single yeah operative. which which is like you know it's okay it, it was a little bit of a stretch in enterprise but it but, they kind of made it work it stayed within the it stayed within the boundaries you know yeah what I mean? they're still secret and, yeah and then they took a discovery and then they're like and now we're a separate uh space organization with their own ships and uh, yeah it's just yeah Oh, you know, I, you know, and then, and then they're bringing in like Rachel Garrett. I like Rachel Garrett as a character, but I'm afraid of what they're going to do with the character. Right. And then that, you know, it wedges the time period in that lost era, which a lot of people are excited about. I could, I could be excited about. I love the lost. I love the lost era. The problem with doing it then, if you look at all the visuals in this trailer yeah nothing visually matches anything right. that we've seen before right so it's gonna and, could go in a dis, uh, direction like discovery look, discovery of reimagining everything and the, and yeah. the thing is like while i don't agree with it i understand why reimagining some of the stuff in the original series makes sense for modern true. audiences true yeah in strange uh, worlds i think that they haven't you really, really don't need to with the yeah. stuff right after the undiscovered country in between right. the next generation yeah, because it's, it's still not, 
it, it's still visually consistent if you look at yeah. Star Trek Five. I know we just made a joke about that, but if you look at the sets, you know the yeah. the, the, br- the bridge looks like what you would expect a Star Trek bridge to look like, and yeah. you know it's the same thing. It, it's something that if you walked onto it, you wouldn't say like, "Hey, this looks like it's made out of cardboard." You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and you know they really they couldn't really take Pike's bridge from the cage and be like, "Now we're going to have a show on it in the year 2022." I mean, it, it could, it, but you have to like there's there's a way you could do it but it's a little right. hard right exactly so they took they took a, a a less a path of kind of lesser resistance they still put together a bridge that i thought was pretty great so yeah reimagining but yeah i'm my, i'm with you that i my fear about the section 31 is that it's going to be more discovery ish where we just need to be like blue we're messing things up a little bit because yeah i mean discovery that first season with their lower with their take on the mirror universe just didn't really jibe because it was contemporaneous with what we saw from the original series which was just what you saw in the original series but just flipped upside down yeah um so i i I just i just don't know all right the the uh the strange new world sneak peek looks like a lot of fun but that show just generally with the exception of the and again this puts me in the hot take category not a lot of people agree with me but i didn't enjoy the musical that's about the only segment i didn't either (laughs) <laughs> that I just really didn't care for. Todd and I really didn't like it. Uh, our, uh, former, I, I think our for former me, chat. part of it was just the eclectic mix of music. If it was something right. consistent, yeah. it would have been better. For yeah. Me. Yeah. I like, and it's not that I'm not a musical guy. Music is my other huge passion. Uh, I, I've, I've worked I in music- musicals all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was a part of musical theaters in high school. Uh, music is my life too, but yeah, I just didn't. I didn't love the songs. I mean, I, they got added to I think my Amazon Prime Unlimited, and I skipped them when they come along because I don't want to hear them anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I think Lower Decks is is not going to disappoint. Uh, obviously, uh, well, this is probably the second episode because the first episode we have a cliffhanger to resolve. Uh, so that maybe, is true. Yeah, yeah, we have a cliffhanger to resolve, so that's kind of a big deal. So yeah, the. I, I'm not sure what I think about this Strange New Worlds thing. Like, I know that they're up to shenanigans. It's They're just bringing back a thing that I'm not the biggest fan of, which is that um, DNA modification yeah, um, yeah. thing. Mostly because the way that it's used here is different than how it was used with Spock in right. season one, where all of right. a sudden now all not not just features change, but like hairstyles change, right. which, you know, OK, whatever. But yeah, it uh, seems then it like seems cool. personalities yeah. alter, and then and then all of a sudden they become speciesist, which is just very. I don't know. I don't yeah. like the idea that the DNA that quickly alters the personality because I think the personality is something that's not tied to the genetics, sure. and so the fact that they're doing that is just. As a philosopher, this bothers me. <laughs> I, I get it, and yeah, speciesist is a great way to portray it because you're saying, well, all Vulcans behave the same way. Well, we know that they don't because yeah. we've seen a wide variety of... We have, uh, but it does mean that yeah. the DNA that they use, they are now implying that Vulcans are by nature assholes, which... Yeah, exactly. Mm, and, I mean, and then it's like, oh, well, we're now we're experiencing Vulcan emotions. Okay, but you shouldn't be able to control them if you're experiencing Vulcan emotions because you don't have have training training. to do that. But again, suspense of disbelief, it could be fine. It's just this segment I wasn't the biggest fan of. If they make it fun. All right, well, let's wrap things up by talking about, uh, this was very unexpected for me, uh, a big announcement of uh, a lot more of the cast. Now we got some recurring uh, and some uh, some regular cast members. Recurring ones are, not surprising, Oded Fair returning as Admiral Vance. Same Which I'm favorite. totally happy with. Yeah. I love that character. Absolutely. We're getting our de- absolutely delightful Tig Notaro's yet, Reno, as a series regular. Which I really? think is, uh, unless I read this. I must have missed that. Yeah, no, that is. Notaro will be a serious regular uh, with uh, the last one, which is Mary Wiseman, Tilly, character I'm not fond of, but we'll let that go. Uh, uh, Fair and uh, Wiseman will be recurring. But the biggest surprise and a delight simply because I've met this man several times. I've had fun conversations with him. Uh, he told my wife that I thought that he thought I was handsome, which I will carry with me till my dying day. I'm talking about Robert Picardo uh, as the EMH. Let's face it, he's a computer program. They don't age, though they're going to have to write that in somehow. Uh, we've been enjoying him as Star Trek Prodigy, but he's going to be back on the show 
uh, as a series regular. Oh my God, he is a delightful human being. Hilariously, there was a comment that like they decided that once they saw him in Prodigy season two, and it's like, yeah, then yeah. why did you cancel it? You right, goobers. exactly. Well, I, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know that Prodigy is dead. Dead. I think it was just it well, was floating. It was floating. It, because- it's in limbo, and the, it, there's a question as to whether or not it's going to get a season three. But the, yeah, the, it's yeah. just a weird one of like, well, then why did you drop it? And right. Exactly. Yeah. Put your money where your mouth is. But anyway, uh, kudos to that. I love I love Robert Ricardo. We did. Uh, we do have other cast members. I hope that he's at least able to, you know, give input to his character so that the character is consistent. I feel I feel that like- sometimes with some newer, n- not so much with Picard season three, but with some other stuff where it's like they'll reference legacy characters. And it's like, mm. Maybe you, maybe your dialogue isn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, other cast members will include Karen Brooks, Bella Shepard, George Hawkins, Karim, uh, Diane, and Zoe Steiner. And, of course, series being headed up by Academy Award winner Holly Hunter with occasional guest star uh, Paul Giamatti. So this is going to be uh, a beast of a show. Um, and I just I, I have my hopes and prayers that it's going to take up. It's going to pull out of the dive that I personally felt discovery was i'm sorry i mean you and i not huge discovery fans we're not missing you know but but discovery does absolutely have its fans and i want to always remind our listeners that we're respectful of that even if you get peter and i we're of like minds about a lot of things and we do have other people that come in and out of the show we may not have loved discovery but that's okay um because it's there for you to love we just don't happen to be the yeah. ones but again that's why we have over on threads and on instagram uh secret friends unite uh at secret friends Unite, excuse me and of course i am at the c3 if you feel differently about it drop us a line i'm happy to read uh thoughts uh, from people who listen to the show on our program. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, you know, it's IDIC, baby. It's about keeping your mind open to the different possibilities. So yeah, so that's great news. Uh, there'll be more news developing, but the show would be three hours long if we talked through all of the bits and pieces. But let's move, yeah, let's move on to talking about um, episode six, seven, and eight of the second season of Star Trek Prodigy, currently available on Netflix. They did a, they did a super dump on July 1, so all the episodes are available. Both Peter and I have watched them all, but what we decided is that we broke them up into groups of three uh, so that we could have a little bit more time to talk about them, and it would also uh, wrap us up in time uh, for the October release of uh, the, the final season of Lower Deck. So, without further ado, Peter, episode six... Take us away. All right. Episode six, imposter syndrome, hoping to hijack the infinity before it's scheduled destruction. Doll and the crew create holographic duplicates to cover for their absence. Do, 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 do. Ferris Bueller. <laughs> yeah. Shenanigans ensue. Oh my gosh. It's the Ferris Bueller. I might have to put that in. So, all right. Well, tell me how you're feeling while I try to name this episode. Um, well, this episode is, is a bunch of fun where you have, the, they're trying to figure out like, Oh, we need to, um, capitalize on the message that we received in the previous episode so they decide they're going to take the infinity and you know they're sitting there trying to figure out how they're going to do that and then they find out that the infinity is going to be destroyed by being thrown into a sun oh man i tell you that's the way to deal with your vehicle issues is i mean it's kind of like it's kind of like an insurance scam like oh i gotta get rid of my old car so i'm just gonna park it downtown and leave the keys in the ignition (laughs) <laughs> almost except i mean this right. time it does blow it's supposed to like disintegrate but it, right. it's kind of funny it's like how do we destroy the ship well we're not going to like set it to explode or just sit there and watch it or we're, we're throwing it into a star right okay exactly which correct. you know it works it's just amusing um right. it, it would work if the kids didn't again steal something which they yes, do which they do in the end but it's hilarious where you have rock and jankum trying to program different versions of themselves and first they're like they don't work very well and like jankum is like climbing the ceiling <laughs> and they're all and they're all yeah glitching ultimately uh when they use the holograms uh the holograms kind of turn on them they're chasing them around and there's a lot of this this and that and ultimately obviously when the kids escape the holograms are reintegrate like they had it because they were glitchy. They, they rebooted them. them, yeah. And rebooted them, but when they rebooted them, different personalities ended up yeah. in the wrong yeah. avatar. Not the memories and not the names, but the personality matrix got right. switched, which is lends to some massive goofiness in the next yeah. episode. 
a- yeah, absolutely correct. So, um, yeah. So this was, um, I wasn't like over the moon about this episode because I felt like it was, I, I noted it was a pastor episode. And yeah, I said, kind of, yeah. It was kind of a, we need to get from, they figured it out to now they're doing a thing. Yeah, yeah. And I said, you're not sure if there's going to be a payoff or it's just shenanigans. Because we did just get the shenanigans, which, of course, you can enjoy. Um, I do continually enjoy the fact that Jason Jason Alexander, or George Costanza, as I put in my notes, is the ship's counselor, and, he, and he's also a Tellerite. There's um, a really funny line in there where yes. you have, where you have uh, Jankum has, like, this existential crisis because he thinks he's not the real one because... There's, they do this thing with a replicator. Whoever can do it, fix it best is the real Jenkin Pog. No, so the one that we know as the audience comes out and he's like, oh, I don't know, who am I? What am I? And the, and there's the counselor going like, oh, do you need to talk about it? Oh, I don't have time. He runs away. And then the counselor's just like, you know what? I just finished my shift. I don't have time for this. I'm going to the holodeck. <laughs> he does. And the line is set tropical hot tub with extra bubbles. That's what yes, I wrote it's down. So <laughs> like, it's just so silly. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. I did write. I thought the holograms were a little too sophisticated and the yeah. zero hologram was also a telepath. I just, just like, I think they said that it wasn't because they were like, I can't read you. Oh, okay. so that the, the yeah. hologram didn't know that it wasn't telepathic, but it knew that it couldn't read people. Right. I think right, right, right. was my take on it. Gotcha. So, yeah, so I just, I, I kind of gave this one a six out of 10. I thought it was just in between um, yeah. and, and that there was kind of more to come. So how about you? Yeah, probably 6.57. So yeah. I mean, not much but more than yours. I enjoyed it, but again, it is, it does feel like a people mover episode. <laughs> <laughs> that they had one of those in Detroit, where when I was a kid, my uncle Chris called it the Mugger Mover. But oh. uh, downtown Detroit in the in in the nineteen eighties was pretty unsavory, so very very different now. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> much res- much respect uh, to our listeners, like our friend Josh Sherell of the USS Motown uh, over in SFI, over in the city of Detroit. So love to see my hometown making a come around. All right, well, as sometimes happens, when you go from uh mediocre mediocre can tilt really quickly into bad which is what i personally feel like we get with the next episode so episode seven is the fast and the curious after using a borg conduit to travel through time faster down this friends find themselves at the mercy of a demanding Kazon. wait that's uh, the description travel they're not traveling through time they're traveling through space faster uh, so they spend less time they uh using a to travel through, it does say travel through time. Yeah, space. it's it's definitely that, a transport that, conduit, yeah. not a time travel conduit. That's a, but that's okay, a, yeah. that's memory, knock, maybe uh, it's a knock on you, memory that. alpha. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> not mind it. Well, actually, one of us could go in then. I it. could fix it. I so there I, you go. Yeah. Make a uh, note of it. So, um, yeah. Uh, so now we're going through. A, oh, I wrote shortcut time going through a Borg transport pub, which is just lying around, but it's still. Yeah, working. they said that there's. Dormant Borg tech, which I'm not. But if it's dormant, it's it a little work. bit of a weird. I mean, dormant yeah. Borg stuff always works. It's just yeah, a little weird that it's like, yeah, dormant because it's like we just had the Borg in season one, so obviously yeah. the Borg are still around doing stuff. So why is it just? It, I don't know. Yeah, because it's before their big Waterloo is at the end of obviously the third season of Picard. But this right. is also not that long after the, what we thought was their Waterloo at the end of Voyager. Well, I guess it's several years, but yeah. Um, so yeah, the, our gang's going through the trans warp. A MacGuffin device pops out inside of it and slaps them on the ship and forces them out of warp to some yeah. random planet. And that's when things really take a big tilt because they land and he's like, oh, this MacGuffin is a Kazon device. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me just take you on the little Kazon time travel tra- uh, in the Wayback Machine. Strap yourselves in, boys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Kazon, this came from season two of Voyager. The Kazon were a refugee race of slaves that were ruled over by a race called the Trabe. Okay, and this was this was in an episode. I think it was Alliances in season two of yeah. Voyager. The Trabe, uh, having had the the tables turned on them, they became these species on the run. And the Kazon, with all their little factions and segments and stuff, were ruling that part of space. Uh, you find out that everything in the Kazon they have they stole from the Trabe. There is no Kazon technology, uh, and there's certainly no new uh, Kazon tech. Uh, so yeah, 
Um, and I, I, I and I wrote that they were just kind of a janky ass group of dummies. They were not masterminds. They weren't like I'm a great case on scientist. I mean, they couldn't make a replicator work even after no. they stole it. Just the Kazon sucked. It was a reason you never really saw them again after season two. There's they a were reason just, no one really likes them. Yeah. They, they, you know, they were a villain that they tried out, which Voyager had several. You know, each show had several. The Ferengi were supposed to be the big bad of TNG in the first season. But and they, they were trans- so much of a joke that they couldn't yeah, do it. That they became, a, they, they, you know, and they, they transitioned them into being something else. But that just really doesn't. Uh, work for this, so I literally call bullshit on the rest of the episode at this point. I Pretty was much. that, yeah, that just really yanked me out. I mean, the whole thing turns into oh, the Kazan guy wants him to do this, this, uh, this race with thus the name of the episode, uh, uh, a riff on the Fast and the Furious. Um, and yeah, and it turns out there's like a Landrew style computer running things and it, it tries to overtake Zero and, and to destroy it, Zero has to throw himself into it and it cripples his suit. So that's obviously um, running things forward. The part of it back on Voyager where we have weird time trendles, uh, time tendrils that pop out and they grab uh, the... Yeah, that's the only episode. really plot relevant thing yeah, in exactly. this episode. Otherwise, yeah, this is just a, a total loser and I, I don't have a lot more to say about it. I mean, do you? It just was a real dud for me. I don't have a whole lot more to say. I mean, the only thing that we really get is some more development sort of of the Dahl really wants to be captain, but really shouldn't be because he's a little bit too impulsive. Yeah. Which we've yeah. known for since like episode three of season one. Right. So it's right. not, that's not a new thing. Um, but so outside of that, we really don't learn a whole lot or know a whole lot more. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was sitting there grinning a little bit because, you know, it's a supercomputer like Landry Agamus. And so I'm just like, right. another computer doing weird weirdness. OK, is it the re- come for the festival? Eh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I like that was funny. That that was funny to me. Um, yeah, because yeah, I. Yeah, because back on Voyager, we don't even get much of anything other than um, yeah. Michelle trying to talk to um the, Gwen and then the, the, finding the, the, Gwen missing after there's a time stop, which that's the important part. Uh, but other than that, the rest of this episode is kind of the Kazan are robots because the computer is creating things to just race. And there's right. no real reason to why this is continuing to keep on right. going other than I seek perfection. OK, so you're sort of trying to be the Borg, but you're not. Right. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's. it's it, yeah. It's kind of a Borg. Oh, God, I just came up with a new uh, Borg Miller Light. There you go. There's an name. The there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Borg Filler uh, Light. Borg. Oh, my God. Borg Filler. Sorry, I know this is great radio. <laughs> Borg Filler Light. There you go. Oh, my gosh. All right. So, yeah, this was like a – it was a 5 out of 10 for me. This is a cheap Fast and Furious knockoff, and Fast and Furious is terrible anyway. If you don't, don't agree, please fight me on, on the internet. Uh, and revisit it kind yeah. of the same thing of like the thing that I wanted to save is my family. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> so and, yeah, I think I think revisiting the Kazon is like a really poor overreach trying to get. Yeah. Back I mean, the Kazon were in way. season one, but they were like background. Right, and they were they were slavers, which made sense because all of our people worked in like a worked in like a Kazon mine camp, a mining camp. Yeah. Didn't they, am I mm-hmm. remember correctly? Yeah. So I, leaving them there is good. Bringing them back, I don't I, like. I said and making you know, them like, oh no, they're bad. I mean, the the way that I took Jankum's line at the beginning was like, oh, it's the Borg. No, it's the Kazon. Oh, that's worse. It was more of a, hey, hey, yeah, they're not good. But yeah. that's not, that's not kind of how the line was meant, unless yeah. it was like a double, right, <laughs> double meaning sort of wink, wink at the audience. I don't know. Right. But. precisely so all right well okay well let's finish it up with our little uh we've gone through these kind of quickly um let's finish up with episode eight which i thought was a nice turnaround so take it this away this one's an interesting episode so episode eight is there in beauty no truth which is obviously a twist on the old tos episode Correct. which also has to do with medusans in in truth is there no beauty yes their uh, debut yeah so which, the, which also had diana moldar in it it did later who later becomes dr polanski and who later plays another character in uh right with, um, yeah a, uh, i can't the remember Sargans, the name of the episode Sargans, but, the Sargans. Yeah. yeah it was so, the return to tomorrow maybe i think maybe. so man okay. i'd have to look uh okay. Anyway, the crew detours to a colony of non-corporeal entities who offer Zero an opportunity to obtain a physical body 
Meanwhile, on Voyager, Janeway discovers Dahl's real intentions. Right, right. Mainly discovering more issues of what they're getting into. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. Intentions, intentions are clear. The shenanigans, she has uncovered the shenanigans. Now, so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump out here, and I'm, I'm going to take something controversial. Uh, we know that pronouns are a very big issue in the world today. I don't have a stance on that. Besides the grammatical, because I'm a, because I'm a journalist and, and, uh, and, and an English major light, English major adjacent. Um, <laughs> the, per, the perfect use of they to describe zero totally works for me because he's a non-corporeal being, thus no gender, uh, thus call, and, and it is kind of a weird, like it still feels like an insult. It's you know? objective. It's in yeah. the sense that it's an object, not right. a person. It's not personal. Right. It's not a personal so pronoun gonna, per se. I'm going to leave personal pronoun politics and all those things outside of our show because I just don't. I don't feel it's appropriate nah. to talk about it. That doesn't work for me. But I will say that the use of they when describing zero totally. Oh, I thought it. Me. I've figured. I, I felt yeah. that it worked pretty well for zero most of the time. Yeah. There's just a couple moments in this episode and a couple times where occasionally they decline it weirdly yeah um so it's like uh, like themselves it's like it's that it would be themselves in this particular instance the right. way that you're using it but still not with the great <laughs> i know i know <laughs> for nazi part of me just sometimes when they're doing goes yeah. ah, no I, in that case i like to simply call people by their names Yes, you can't go wrong with that. And uh, yes, what in whatever name that they choose to call themselves, whatever it is, it was, it was, I don't know. It's not my thing. But regardless, anyway. um, <laughs> this is kind of nice. So, so I, I'm I'm trying to remember because uh, I, I guess I had to make a note of it. So they get back in the infinity. Are they? Do they get back in the Borg transport kind of? No, and they're just traveling normally at this point, okay, which is so interesting. Well, You'd think yeah, that they want to go back yeah. in the conduit, but but they're still they in can't. the. I would assume if they're traveling north, but it's transwarp, so they could have made their way closer back. Yeah, they're they're a lot closer than they already were, so right. it's okay. it's definitely shortened their time. It's just we don't know how close they were and when they got kicked out. Gotcha, gotcha, so, gotcha, gotcha. But they're traveling normally at this point. At least gotcha. that's that's how it looks from the viewports. So. Right. So yeah, they found this great colony of non corporeal beings. I just call them NC in my notes, which is that that means Newt Caprica, Newt Caprica <laughs> on our battle star. It's not the same. Um, Obviously, they name dropped several different non corporeal races. At the yeah, time. that's that was really, and I should have written them down, but I yeah, didn't. they're Paxons, Medusans, Corellians, or uh, no, was it was the, the it? Synthurians, Scytherians. Yeah, yes. something like that. Absolutely, I do think so, it's kind of cool that the these NCs have avatar bodies that are vaguely looking like the ones from the movie. They're not quite as blue. But they're tall and lanky, um, which I, I mean, it's cool. I, I think the producers of the show, show do a great effort in reaching out to connect this to other things in pop culture that are also very popular. There's a lot of aspect of Star Trek Rebel or like Star Wars, like Rebels in this or Bad yep. Batch. And now it's Fast and Furious and now it's Avatar. Because, again, Star, you know, this is this is a show for children, literally. Yep. Um, yep. So finding ways for them to associate like, oh, yeah, hey, this is kind of like Avatar, but it's still part of the show I'm watching. I think that's very smart. I, I, yes. I, 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 yeah, I think that that's I think that that's pretty. Impressive. And it's also yeah. fun how they have like the, the pods like the pods in Avatar. They do look like some. It was reminding me of something from Alien. Right. But, oh, which is yeah. a completely different thing. Very, um, and, and, just and, and, just and the layout. Need to, don't need to take your kids to see that. Yeah, just the layout. But the. Uh, um but like the pods where they create the bodies was very yeah. avatar ish. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I absolutely love uh, that. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. This is the first time now back on Voyager on the holodeck. I feel like the first time we're ever seeing Parisi squares in the real it world. It is. It's the first time that we've seen Parisi squares. I have seen a, a rendition of the field that I used in a fan animation. Yeah. Um, which is very different. Yeah. Um, so this, but this one, I'm actually quite a fan of. It's one of those like, hey, we've never seen this before, and, and here's goes, the hammers and everything, and it bounces, and you, you can yeah. see how it might be dangerous. This goes all the way back um, to 1987 to the season first one season of it, TNG, uh, yeah. where it got a mention. Actually, 1988, it got a mention in the uh, the, the, the 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 one zero 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 episode where they yep. 
Tachi Yar and company yeah. coming wearing blue jumpsuits. Yeah, and those are cool ass jumpsuits. Shit, I'd take that cosplay. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, a Starfleet has great athleisure wear. I will tell you that. They right do. Now. And I would wear that shit like I wear a lot of uh, stuff from a brand called Zaya, which is a brand that April has sold from time to time. Nice stuff. Uh, Zaya, get in. Zaya, listen to me. If you get, you know, at me on social media, I, I, I can help you make a line of Star Trek athleisure wear. And I think it would it would be the bomb. Hey, there's 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 a there is a market. There is a market. I'd be very interested. Um, but, yeah, we get uh, we get. the So back on. Uh, the non-corporeal planet. Z wakes up, and and now they aren't just a nobody, which is, is another. Which was what, one, of, but thankfully everyone groaned because it right. was a bad. Yes, thank, yeah, exactly. Uh, they have the feast of the senses belching contest that were you know that worked. That was good. funny. Yeah, that, For, that worked. It's definitely a kids joke, little boy yeah. joke, but it was it was funny. And uh, so, but anyway, the, the, there's a feats of strength contest, which is the kind of the running of the the Nazamond, which is this big ass manta ray that's got to chase him down. Um, yeah, it's like a whale that's eating yeah. flowers, but if you're in the wrong spot, you get swallowed. Right. And it's your the, the the challenge is to get to the other side. Um, and uh, we were able to execute this. I, Dog gets snatched at one point, so there's a little peril when they got to rescue him. Um, but at the other end of it. Um, you know, Z is faced with the choice from the NC, other NCs. They say, well, the, the strength of your avatar comes from the, this planetary atmosphere, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like the, the fountain of youth or the, the grail temple in Indiana Jones. Like, you've got to stay yeah. here. If you yeah. want to be eternal, your body will start to, to degrade. And he said, I, I really just want to be with my family, so I'm going to go. And I thought that that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Yeah. So An interesting twist in this episode, though, is it's it's kind of the opposite of what most Star Trek things go for with non-corporeal or what a lot of science fiction goes for with non-corporeal beings yeah. and that they are the next step of evolution and they're somehow better. Uh, it's sort of a, a transhumanism. Wow. Um, but this, this idea, the, the idea that's put positioned in this episode, which is interesting is that there's something lacking without a physical form. Um, because you can't fully experience reality. Yeah. And so there's something very interesting about the fact that this episode took that as its kind of base message. Mm -hmm. um, it, interesting because it flies in the face of how things are normally taken with, with these sorts of beings. But yeah. also it's interesting because it helps like um, it helps with like younger people or, you know, people in general, like, Hey, there's something beautiful about being you. There's something right. beautiful about being being this that you can touch, being able to touch other people, being able to see things, being able to touch things, taste things, you know, do that belching contest, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, so it's just it's really interesting how this one is very, very positive about the nature of physical existence, because um, some of us in the modern day just tend to live in our minds so much you know we're so detached we face we're living in the digital world with computers and games and all of that stuff but this this episode is like no there's something really good about being outside or being right. out and and being real with other right. real people and so there's, like, there's something yeah. it's a great example like yesterday you joined me on the pickleball court had your first experience playing pickleball true there you yeah, go. So it's like there's there's something really and that's kind of why I think they did something with where they twisted around the title of the TOS episode. Yeah. Because is there no beauty is there in beauty no truth? Like is there in our physical form? Is there no, right. is it is there not something that's true and beautiful and good? And right. so that was so this episode gets like really high marks for me because of that yeah. like underlying meta. So yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, this was an eight out of ten for me. Uh, I thought the Avatar plotline—I contradict myself in my notes, but I, I kind of turned myself around. I, I, I thought th that got a little stretched out, but I also appreciate why it existed. But I, I did love at the end Z cho choosing to be with his family over yeah. immortality because that's what you know, family first. That's that's who these guys are <clears throat> to each other because they don't have anybody else but each other. So exactly. I really do I really do appreciate that. So well, good. All right. Well, um, yeah. Lord next uh, or uh, Prodigy is plugging along. Um, so our next episode we'll grab episodes nine, ten, and eleven. 
Um, and like I said, this will wrap us up just in time to return to our great segment, which is the random episode, uh, which I'd like in the future, as we get into bigger gaps, uh, I'm going to start reaching out to the folks on our Patreon Discord channel and our Patreon in general to help us choose those episodes. We do that via kind of a random chance. We, you know, grab a, uh, we grab a, a number one through 12, which is a series that'll have to grow now, too, because we have new shows. Rolling. Yeah, we got new stuff. We're going to have to yeah. increase the number. So, um, yeah, exactly. But then, yeah, you roll that. Then you roll uh, for a season. You roll for an episode. And then that's uh, what you get. And that way, we're always talking about something to, uh, dictated by the hand of fate. But... As we move into segment two, uh, we're continuing along our journey in the fifth season of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I mean, oh my God, we get into a block of episodes where things are intense and there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is uh, coming in from uh, from early 1997. It was my uh, junior year at Michigan, Michigan State. Uh, heavy duty into, you know, watching every week and I have friends who were into it and it was just, this was, this was the, 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 the closer to the end of the golden era uh, of the nineties Star Trek. Cause again, we're, you know, it's 97 and, and uh, DS9 mm -hmm. still has, still has two years left. So there's still so much more to go. We're not even into the dominion war yet though. No, sometimes it feels like it, but we're not there yet. We do, but I'm uh, this. The, the first two segments are a two parter. Uh, I will read the uh, summaries and we'll discuss them kind of as one. Uh, episode 14 is In Purgatory Shadow. Uh, director is Gabrielle Beaumont, and I know that she was quite well renowned as being one of the first, fem what, if not the first. Uh, female director of anything Star Trek. She had a, a oh, long, really? yeah, long storied career of doing this. Uh, this is Robert Hewitt Wolf and I were Stephen Bear. So you got the best of the best right in this deal. Um, in uh, By Inferno's Light is the next segment. Les Landau and Iris uh, directs, and again, uh, Bear and Wolf. Uh, writing this, uh, both from February of 1997. Uh, Worf and Garrick journey to the Gamma Quadrant to investigate a coded Cardassian message. Uh, and in the second part, Old Dukat aligns the Cardassians with the Dominion. The station must deal with the Changeling Infiltrator. Wow. Yeah. This, and again, she this goes south fast. This was one that you're like, ah, uh, because, yeah, part one ends with uh, the wormhole popping open and all these ships coming out. I know we're kind of putting the cart before the horse. And so you get this great like, oh, my God, I know it's only seven days, but what's going to happen now? We're going to come back and it's going to be Battle Royale. And then, yeah, Golden Cut running off to join the Dominion I did not see that coming. Um, but it, it does absolutely end up making sense at the end of it. But anyway, the episode starts out, uh, there's a, a coded message coming through that's from a Navrin Tain that was uh, Garrick's mentor and so much more, as we learn in this episode and the next one. Um, yep. And so Garrick tries to steal a runabout and sneak off to uh, into the Gamma Quadrant to find him based on uh, this recording. Uh, he gets intercepted. Uh, Cisco says, uh, Worf's going with you. Uh, and so Garrick is riding with Worf and annoying the shit out of him when they run into, which is classic Garrick. Yeah. Perfect. I love stuff. Garrick. It's, you know, it's, it works. Yeah. Andy Robinson, who, again, I've, I've met him on a couple different occasions, uh, through the, the cruise and, and cons. And I think he's, he is our guest at Grand Rapids Comic Con this fall. So we'll all get to see him again. Ooh. Definitely look, look forward I'm to I'm going to go have to meet one of my favorite characters. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yes. So they, they get captured by the Dominion by running into a bunch of ships. Uh, they get dumped in an internment camp where they find that the real Martok is and. here. He's alive. And uh, as they all uh, converge in a prison cell where they see that an Abertain is lying there dying. And we see our first, not, this is not the first time we see a Breen. But it's the first time we hear one. It's the first time we still don't hear one speak. We haven't no, got. It doesn't very, speak at all. Yeah, it doesn't speak at all. But there's a Breen and a Romulan, so it's kind of this, you know. There's two Romulans uh, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, bye. Uh, one of them gets killed really quickly. So it's kind of a United Benetton uh, of uh, of a prison cell. Um, but uh, the last prisoner gets shoved back into the room after coming back from interrogation, and it's Bashir. Uh, the problem is there's a Bashir back on the station who is yeah. not a Bashir. That is the Changeling Infiltrator. Yeah, I mean, too. of note, he is wearing the uniform that we only switched from about 10 episodes ago. Not, so, not, yeah, not even. even. So it, it does show so that. It doesn't have to be that long, but it does kind of make it a little weird sometimes. And we've also learned that, you know, Star Trek uniforms overlap so greatly that you don't even necessarily know 
when people start stopped wearing them. You never really saw those two uniforms, meaning the one that people watch us on YouTube that Peter's wearing now, which is the black and gray, or the Voyager Classic, which is the black jumpsuit. Department with color shoulder. to shoulder. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is the, the uniform that has had the single most appearances because it was four seasons of DS9 and seven whole seasons of Voyager, plus uh, appeared in Star Trek First Contact. Um, and for my money... Uh, using the customer that we use uh, for our various cosplay, probably the, one of the best uniforms out there uh, that that they make because for, for yep. its accuracy, I think. Yep, that one's the most accurate out of all. Of uh, but at any rate, yes, things start to... Ducat shows up on the station because he's going to help out. They know the Dominion is coming because uh, Kira tries to go find them and, and all their listening posts are going dead. And so, as I said, the wormhole pops open at the end of episode one and all these ships come out. And then we segue over to the first part of the next one. Everybody, you know, cares on the Defiant. I love how the runabouts come out like, we're going to help too. It'd be like if you had three kittens and a Rottweiler. And that's your defense force, you know what I mean? And then Ducat is the, uh, like a Chihuahua. I'm, I say that, my dog is part Chihuahua. But the Chihuahuas are little beady eyes and they shit everywhere. That's Ducat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, they it's beat the just, crap out of a Klingon force. And the Klingons have to come to Deep Space Nine to get right. themselves patched up. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, after after it's revealed that that Ducat is right because he turns to run off and join join them and reveals his true colors. Shortly after, uh, Gowron shows up and he's all beat up. And Cisco says, "This is where you know Cisco is the history maker." He said, "You know what? This is the opportunity for us to put aside our differences. We have a common foe." Let and then he says, "I got a copy of the Kittimer Records right here." Eh. And then he's uh, and so he signs it. So the, you know what the the Klingon uh, Federation the kerfuffle is over. They're allies again. Yeah, um, so that's super fun. So uh, everybody's preparing for an attack. Um, and then uh, the, suddenly yeah. <laughs> the Romulans <laughs> appear. Yeah, and the Romulans appear, which is never really addressed for the I rest. I mean, of since season. since the Romulans were part of the original force to go try to attack the Founders' homeworld, you can understand, because, I mean, the Romulans, as we know, listen to everything and they try to listeners. be... Yeah. They, are, they are up in everyone's business. They just don't like you oh, to know that. Um, right. And so they uh, they just suddenly appear, because like, they're like, oh, shit's going down in Pajor, we're going to show up. So it's right. like, they are well across the neutral zone. They are nowhere near where they're supposed to be, and they yeah, just... Yeah, if you, Deep Space Nine. That's what's crazy, because if you ever look at the galactic map, I have one in, hanging in my dining room. Uh, the Romulan Empire and where DS9 are couldn't be any further. Yeah, they're, they're like the opposite sides of the Federation. Yeah, exactly. Correct. Yeah, you got to go through the entire Federation to get there. Which is hilarious, because it means that you had a fleet of cloaked warbirds just flying through the heart of federation space going like right. yeah we're not up to anything we're just going to yeah. deal with the dominion i mean for all you know they could have taken the long way and going through the north i mean there, gone yeah. around yeah yeah there's a north part that's kind of no man's land but anyway that's it's it, still it, funny yeah <laughs> talk about fictional geography but at the end of the day the bashir changeling uh, tr- uh hijacks one of the runabouts he's got a uh proto matter to bomb yeah, he's gonna try to pull a dr soren on the son right. of Chor. Yeah, exactly. Which they, you know, they, they managed to stop him, uh, and at the end of it, that was the whole plan. Uh, so do, it, now, wasn't it didn't turn out there was no Dominion fleet at all? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it doesn't show up it was in this big, episode. Yeah, it was a big. It was a fake big. Fl- they just wanted to get all of the Alpha Quadrant forces in one place and blow them up. Right, and so Ducat comes back on. Now, during this, when Ducat left the station, uh, he. Uh, uh, for, you know, he uh, excommunicated his daughter, said, you're not my daughter anymore because you want to stay here and you're in love. And you with like Garrick, who I yeah, hate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but then, uh, yeah, he, Cisco says, well, you would have killed your daughter. And he's like, I don't have a daughter anymore. Fuck you. I'm, I'm evil. Meh. Give me a mustache. Give me the mustache that his cousin, you know how his cousin had the had mustache? Those, had those sideburn thingies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when uh, Mark Alimo f- appeared as the first Cardassian in season four of TNG, he was the Go Masset. So it kind of, yeah, t- twisted. It didn't have quite a mustache, but it was getting close. Yeah, it was just to t- touch the sideburns. Um, I'm not changing the name of my sideburns. But yeah. I'd, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be t- tempted to change it to touch my sideburns, but I'm not. It's too weird. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there you go. But anyway, yeah, a pivotal two parter. Um, we will uh, come back and discuss this one in depth. Um, Mm -hmm. as I have it planned on our schedule um, in the distant future uh, once we get through the entire series we're going to come back and explore 
most all of the two parters yep. um, as a really drill down. So we'll, we'll we'll get into this. But for now, extremely important episode. I consider it as a as a one, and probably of this group of episodes, I'll go on record as saying this is this is my favorite, uh, without a doubt. So we can get that out of the way. All right, episode sixteen is yours. Episode sixteen, Doctor Bashir, I presume, directed by David Livingston. Uh, story by Jimmy Diggs, teleplay by Ronald D. Moore. My guy! Aired on February 24th of 97, Ooh, Julian Bashir day, is selected to be... Yeah. Day, after, day after my 21st birthday, so here nice. was me. Uh. <laughs> and you got to watch this episode. Right. Uh, Julian Bashir is selected to become the model for a long-term medical hologram, not to be confused with the emergency medical hologram. Right. Until a family secret is revealed... Our B-plot includes Rom having difficulty in telling Lita something important. Aww. Um, how wonderful. What a wonderful... So we do get... Oh, t- talking more about Bob Picardo. He gets to play uh, uh, one... Yeah, he gets to play Zimmerman, <laughs> who we met uh, in uh, two... Uh, well, not we, we've only seen him once so far in Voyager at this point. Yeah, we see him again later, I think. His second appearance happens in, like, the, the I think the sixth... I think it's six or seven, show. yeah. Yeah, but yeah, he he comes along as the real Zimmerman. We met him as a holographic Zimmerman in Voyager in season two when he mm-hmm. was used as a patch uh, to fix the yeah. doctor's program. Which <laughs> great, yeah, exactly. He's the he's the digital band aid. Um, but yeah, he comes in. He's 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 super obnoxious. He's rubbing everybody the wrong way. Um, but he has to interview everybody to learn about Bashir, and we have kind of the classic. Um, interviewing everyone, but every shot it'll go to him and then go back and he's talking to somebody different, go back talking to somebody different. Um, the best part of that is O'Brien saying, so you're really not going to get back to what I'm going to say, right? Yeah, no, I was totally confidential. He says, well, he's one of the greatest guys I've ever met. He's just a really wonderful guy and he's like my best friend. He's like, but you're really not going to tell him, right? <laughs> classic, classic. Yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, the, the secret don't, is... Yeah. Don't tell him that because I need to give him shit. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. All the time. The secret B- Bashir does tell Zimmerman early on. He says, well, it would be great if you didn't contact my parents because we're not close and it just would be really weird. And then happen. Zimmerman, like the butthole he is, is like, note, talk to parents. Yeah. And he brings them to the station and Bashir is just his face goes white and he's like, because uh, he really just really doesn't get along with his folks. And you don't know why until they, ex- they inadvertently um, have a conversation with the holographic, the holographic version, version of him. of Bashir, who is being produced by saying, at no point will we tell them in our interviews that you were actually genetically engineered as a child. And everybody watching it was like, I'm sorry, what now? <laughs> I mean, Citadel Fidel was kind of the same way when he read that line in the script. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, so it's, it's uh, you know, while, while this is all lingering before he, uh, his plan is to then resign because with someone with genetically genetically enhanced abilities can't be in Starfleet, which it makes sense. The whole con thing, I get it. But he explains his kind of his life story to his best friend to be sure. He said, "You know, I was I was essentially disabled as a kid. I was very slow, didn't understand simple things as a child. So I was by the time I was seven, uh, my parents took me off world, and then they had this done to me, and uh, my life really changed overnight. I got you know I gained five IQ points a day for two weeks." and i just you know they they kind of right-sided me um so yeah and he's like i'm gonna quit and then he goes to cisco's office to quit and cisco is uh on the hollow presence thing which again this is one of its lingering appearances i feel like yeah it it doesn't show up much more after this but it's uh it's the starfleet jag who's saying you know i just made a deal with your dad who's going to go to prison for what he's done um but then he said you know it's, it's a very serious deal you know for every Julian Bashir out there who's, who's good and doesn't and uses his ability for good, there's another con waiting in the wings, and we just can't have that. But you, you're a good guy, and you got a great service record, and we we want to keep you. Um, yeah. But this is this was kind of a, a bridge that was needed um, to mend the rift between Bashir and his parents because his yep. dad is just very one, one of these. He's totally full of shit. He exaggerates. I mean, everybody knows. I know some cosplay photographers like that. They talk big about, oh, I do this and I got this deal, that. A lot of them are really full of crap. Uh, and if the person who I'm talking to listens to my show, you know who you are, but you don't. So it's okay. But I'm thinking <laughs> of one person in particular. I just, I just, I can't stand people who, who, 
basically s their own d sorry pardon me for pardon me for saying so but you, I mean, can, yeah. you know where i'm going um but that's basically what his dad is his dad kind of thinks he's king shit but he's accomplished absolutely nothing um but it is great to see somebody who is so self-obsessed finally step up and do the right thing so i love that about this episode the whole long-term hologram medical thing kind of goes away and zimmerman's like well i guess it's time for me to go home and that's when your b plot manifests itself because through all of this rom is trying to tell lita you know how he feels about her because he's in love with her and which it, we already know that lita likes rom because that was right. mentioned on risa right yeah a few episodes back but she uh finally uh he finally does as she's walking to the airlock to leave, because Zimmerman says, well, come back to me, uh, to Jupiter Station, you can run the cafe, and uh, you also get to see her naked from the back, which isn't such a bad thing, is there, she's having a chance to see Doug and him. Um, and she's like, well, I don't have a better offer, so I'm just going to go. And that's when Rom finally drops by and says, I love you. And she says, Rom, I love you too. And they have a weird kiss with the mouth appliance that Match Grodin chick has with the one tooth that sticks out. I'm like, I hope they pulled that out. I know I read a very famous, not related to this, but I read a very famous quote once that Terry Farrell kissing Michael Dorn as Worf and Dax got snagged on his tooth appliance and cut herself. I was like, Ugh. Uh, I know. Yikes. Talk about talk about hazard pay. Um, but yeah, a very cool episode. The, the ROM stuff is cute. Um the stuff with Zimmerman is great. And then the stuff with, with Bashir and his family is, is really very touching about a character that we otherwise yeah. don't know a lot about their background until this point. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I still tend to agree with um, Sidig al that making Bashir um, genetically modified kind of takes something away from him. Yeah, um, it's it's not the worst decision ever. Like, I'm not going to say, oh, they never should have done it. But it's it's definitely something where occasion there's there's moments where it makes you feel like some moments weren't as genuine, like yeah. Miles and him playing darts. They're, like there's a joke at the end of like, well, I would just wasn't trying as hard because. Yeah, right. Like, oh, okay. So <laughs> okay. I, I get it, but it's there. there There's a I don't know. There's something about it that doesn't quite work yeah um, so again i'm not gonna bemoan it it happened it's fine but right <laughs> i i do tend to agree more with the actor that it it, it feels a little weird so yeah yeah I, it doesn't necessarily change how the character behaves in the future it just sometimes they do have to then like oh well he's can't do this now because of whatever reason yeah, so right. that's all yeah <laughs> That's wild. Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, episode 17, please. Uh, I think this one's yours, actually. Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, a Simple Investigation. Uh, John T. Kretschmer uh, is doing the directing. Don't know him. Uh, Renee Ichivaria does the writing regular to the staff uh, from March of 97. Odo falls in love with the women, Arissa, involved with the Orion Syndicate. Now, this is where we're starting to get um, a recurring uh, sub-thread of the Orion Syndicate. We get that uh, a little bit later in the season. Uh, becomes a bigger deal in season six and seven. Um, and and it's and then now it's become an ongoing, almost, more of a gag as most things are on Lower Decks because yeah. one of the main characters is uh, Orion by, by race. Uh, so yes. you get a little bit of that. So I like that. So um, yeah, kind of a cool episode. A matter of, in the end, which you find out a mistaken identity. But yeah, Odo has his first romance outside of obviously yeah. he's, he's pining for Kira and being pined for by Loxana Troy, which is just, just doesn't really count exactly. Um, but this is great. And he actually has the sex with a uh, corporeal being where he had yeah, the, solid. He, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't even gotten to the point where he, this is his first having the sex because he does end up having the sex with, one on one with the female shapeshifter next season. Sorry, spoiler alerts. Um, yeah, they end up having it human style, which I think is really which is mildly weird. disturbing. But mildly yeah, mildly disturbing, exactly. But then again, if you think about the great length, they're all it's a big orgy, quite frankly, because they're all just in there, right? I mean, if you think about it in that fashion, a very Greco-Roman. Who knows? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, cool episode, kind of throwaway doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anything no, not but really. that being said i don't think it's terrible to take a break 
from no, heaviness they're... because we, we have a lot of heaviness to kick this yeah. off. And then we have a lot of heaviness um, that will wrap up the season, which is coming up pretty quickly. Yeah. Here. As I as I've usually said, like I I'm more of a fan of the longer seasons because we can have filler episodes filler episodes like this right. where right. we take time to look at a character and have them do things that are important for them, but yeah. not plot relevant because it allows us to develop a character in a way that's yeah uh, more rounded. Right. Um, I agree. So, I agree. So yeah. I, this is one of those episodes with Odo. So really, and if you think about it, we kind of get, we kind of get three in a row because the, the next episode is, is really that for another character, which we'll talk about in a second, but yeah, I enjoyed it fine. Um, and it was nice to see, um, Odo get a little bit, and this is even after the time when, you know, he's, he's a changeling again, or a few episodes back, he was normal human, mm -hmm. um, but he's still able to go through a very humanizing experience of love lost and, putting yourself out there and that's you know you know because he has this great scene uh one of the loose looser frameworks around this is that bashir gets a new um a new a holodeck adventure of the dr bashir which is written by his friend felix which i always found was so hilarious because felix was james bond's sidekick in the james bond films or one, one of his associates with the cia um but yeah odo has this talk about uh taking chances in romance and you know it's okay to get your heart broken because otherwise your heart will break from being lonely i thought that that was that was a super yeah. cool speech and at the end of that you do have um Bish or you have o'brien show up as falcon the guy with the eye patch says car trouble mr bashir <laughs> Because <laughs> the whole thing takes place in the back of his limo. So I, I enjoyed that. So good episode. Again, humanizing. But uh, staying on that same thing, we jump into episode 18, uh, which is yours. Sorry, go ahead. All right. 18, Business as Usual, directed by Sidig Al-Fadil. Uh, written by Bradley Thompson and David Weddle. Aired April 7th, 97. Quark's infamous cousin Gala. Uh, the one with the moon? <laughs> <laughs> cousin Gala has a shuttle. Cousin Gala has a moon. Cousin Gala has everything. Ah! Uh, so Gala, knowing Quark is desperate for funds, takes him on as a junior partner in his highly lucrative and <laughs> illegal arms dealing business. Illegal. With his, <laughs> yeah. With his mother Keiko away dealing with a plague on Bajor. Uh, is that the right name? Yeah, yeah, Kiryoshi is. The Ki yeah, it's missing. It's missing the K. Kiryoshi O'Brien will only stop crying when Miles holds him, making working difficult. I love it. It was it was a sitcomy plot thread that oh, totally yeah. worked. It totally worked. Like trying to carry yeah. while he's trying it to work was, on conduits. Yeah. It's like oh my and god. It, at the end of it, the only thing that calms him down is Worf, which is which is you get a nice Worfism at the end where he said, "Well, you know, I was never around my son when he was this age. Keep in mind, we haven't seen Alexander post TNG yet to this point. Yeah, so that was that was really touching, but it's a minor part. But this this was a great episode. Um, Cousin Gala is actor Josh uh, uh, Pice, I think is his name, who was the only thing I I think he was actually one of the Ninja Turtles in the nineteen ninety. Oh, wow. films, yeah. Uh, along with another actor named Brian Brian Troy or Brian Kim, who was one of his Star Trek. He's got two Star Trek connections. He was one of the kids in in the Children Shall Lead, and he oh played, yeah, he played a relief con officer in season four of TNG. Um, boy, my brain, ding ding ding. Um, but uh, the 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 guy who was their boss in this was the bad guy in the first Beverly Hills Cop. That was the mental note I made. <laughs> I know, I know. And uh, at Lawrence Tierney, who uh, was is very infamous in Star Trek circles because he was a holodeck character in season one of TNG called Cyrus Redblock, and apparently was verbally abusive to a young Will Wheaton on the set of Ooh. that show. Yeah, it's it's very famously documented in Will, Will's book, uh, which he talked about when he spoke on the cruise. Um, so I had really not because, yeah, Lawrence Tierney was just apparently he always played heavies and mobster guys, apparently just not a very nice guy. And he's since so him. typecast in a way. Yes, yeah, very much. Yeah, he plays a warlord. And at the end of it, Quark is you know, so overloaded with guilt that he's selling, he's making money from selling weapons that are causing the deaths of countless people that he orchestrates two sides of a conflict being in the same room at the same time and running away and basically getting extra, you know, extracting himself from the situation and destroying the arms business uh, that he's now a part of and making sure that all of his associates are killed. Though cousin Gala 
does live, and we do see him in subsequent episodes. So sorry about the spoiler. Um, but great. But again, this trilogy of episodes, and really it's a quadrilogy when we move on to the next one, of great character moments, development, our people being pushed to their limits, us learning things about them and mm-hmm. digging deep. I think that this episode, and again, it's a Ferengi episode, but it's one with a little bit more heart and, and heart. heart. Like usually Ferengi episodes are corny. Which yeah, I well, love to be well, completely yeah. frank. They're By fun. Design, yeah, absolutely. No, I think they, they pulled it off well. So I like that. Um, and 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 again, dovetailing into we're kind of four for four uh, with the next episode. Episode nineteen, ties of blood and water. Uh, directed by Avery Brooks, so we had uh, mm-hmm. Sid in the previous episode. Avery does this one. Um, looks like we might have gotten some from the slush pile here. A uh, story by Ed, Ed, Edmund Newton and Robin L. Slocum. Uh, teleplay, uh, so kind of mopping up the spec script, uh, is uh, Robert Hewlett Wolf, again from April of 97. Uh, to Kenny Gamore from the episode uh, Second Skin back in season three. Which is a fantastic episode. Absolutely. Arrives on DS9 and reveals that he's dying. It's a very short summary. Um, Ducat and the return of the fantastic Your Friend and Mine. Why have I just forgotten? Jeff Combs' name. Oh, my God. Jeffrey Combs. <laughs> Jeff <returns. Combs. laughs> uh, and in this, we learned that the Vorda are a species of clones. So this yeah. is because we believe that his character, Wayon, did die in season four on his first appearance because he was killed by his own troops, which reminds me of a great line. You've seen the movie Animal House, I assume. The I haven't, actually. Oh, my God. Well, there's a great bit at the end where they're doing the recap of all the characters. Like, here's what happened in their future. The, so, uh, Douglas Niedermeyer killed in Vietnam by his own troops. <laughs> Pretty much, pretty much the same. Go see Animal House. Now you have an assignment. <laughs> that, that, that is a classic. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really it's reve- Ducat shows up uh, and realizes that this to Kenny Gamora, who has been living in exile, he's a revolutionary, and that's why he was kind of taken out of play uh, yep. back in that episode in season three. Uh, has a head full of Cardassian secrets. Ducat's, Ducat wants him muzzled, so he makes this offer because to Kenny Gamora's whole thing is that. He's trying to find his long lost daughter, who is a deep cover operative. Uh, yep. The Cardassian government set up this flim flam where they made it look like Kira was this daughter, and of course she was not. So Dakot says, "Hey, if you come home, I know where your daughter is." Like he's just Cardassian stuff, full of shit. Yeah, he is. He is. Yeah. And Gamora says, "You know what? If you had come to me like man to man or Cardassian, Cardassian, we could have made a deal. But you're with." the dominion now and if i make a deal with you i'm making a deal with them i'd rather just die is that okay with you um but then ducat does what ducat does and goes to kieran says hey you know what he was also actually at this camp that did this thing that wiped out all these people so he's a bad guy so i wouldn't you know he should uh, probably give him up yeah, should, yeah what do you think uh it's like, like yeah it's like he's trying to sell you a used car yeah, he, eh? I mean, ducat is the sleaziest of scumbags yeah. villains he's, he does, he's yeah, he like throws an villain, at him. but he's awful yeah it's bad it's bad so um so in this it's interspersed with flashbacks from kira as a teenager uh where she's huddled in a cave with her dad who is dying of a of a phaser wound mm-hmm. and she's standing by his side when uh we do get the return of um what's his face the guy with the one arm uh oh darn I'm drawing a blank on his name. Great actor, though. But he died. He died in in present time a few episodes back. Yeah. But he comes in and he says, "Hey, we got this mission that we can go uh, hit such and such." And she's like, um, "Dad, I'll be back because uh, I have a chance to avenge your." It was turns out avenge your death. But he was still alive, and he's like, "Here, don't leave me. You know, Norris, don't leave me. Don't leave me." And then she comes back, and he died while she was gone. And mm-hmm. so she's having PTSD because Gamora is a father figure, but she's angry with him. But then she realizes that it's Ducat was fucking with her. And, 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 and Gamora was, a, was like a, like 18 years old when this, he, and he was attached to this command when it happened. So he wasn't really involved per se. Um, so she forgives him. Then he dies. So Ducat doesn't get his prize. And at the end of it, um, she buries Gamora on Pedro right next to her, her, her father, her biological yeah. father. So, Great ending, but yeah, yeah. It, uh, Kira has this great um, uh, two take with Odo, where she's saying, "I was there where my father died," um, and so I was I was to have difficulty quantifying that with this situation, and uh, it was it was a good it was a good spread for her. I thought it was really yeah. Good. This is a really good. I mean, the, the relationship that that Kira has with Takeni Gamor 
is just really solid over the two episodes that he exists in because he's only in these two right um and so it's just really interesting how like she took to heart the fact that he w- he wanted to be a father figure to her in Second Skin. Yeah. And then you see like it's a very, very, you know, paternal uh, relationship that they like uh, parent to child relationship that they have in this episode, especially with her getting mad at him and, you know, right. all of that. And then there's reconciliation and all of that. And there, there's just there's some really, really, really good character moments in this episode. And then there's Jacob being a schmuck like normal. So it's, it's what he does. Yeah. It, oh it's, it's classic Ducat. Ducat the schmuck. <laughs> Ducat the schmuck. Oh my goodness. Well, that takes us uh, out of these segments. Uh, let's do a favorite and a least favorite. I already went on record and potentially agree with me, but if you feel different, love to hear it. Um, best for me was 14 and 15, which is the two parter, uh, which does deliver the Cardassians uh, in the hand into the hands of the Dominion. We didn't even mention the real other big reveal is that Tane is Garrick's long lost father. Right. We didn't, I, we didn't even mention we, that. We forgot to mention that, which is also explored extensively in Andrew Robinson's book, A Stitch in Time, right. which now is an audible copy where he reads it, which is fantastic. I, and I have it, and I listened to maybe the first chapter. Oh, I listened to the whole thing. It's great. I really have to get back to it. So, but yeah, that is available on Audible. And we did, I did actually have the pleasure of listening to Mr. Robinson read a chapter of that uh, when we were on the cruise. Oh, day. that's fun. That was, that was pretty great. Um, but yeah, that's my number one favorite. If I was to pick one that was less interesting as i said i all felt they were pretty good um but i would probably say a simple investigation was 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 just okay you know yeah. what i mean just because it was kind of lo- it was kind of low stakes no stakes it was a zero sum game at the end of it the woman came along and then she left and odo learned something a little bit but yeah kind of maybe sort of kind of maybe yeah. sort of so how about you um i kind of want to go with ties of blood and water as being my favorite nice um i I just really like that relationship between Gamora and Kira. Yeah. Um, it's just really solid. I, um, I think it, this may have been one of Avery Brooks first episodes that he directed. Um, it's, it, and it's great. It's a really good episode. Yeah. Um, least favorite. Um, I would agree with you that simple investigation is probably the, the least in terms of just, it doesn't do much. Yeah. Um, for me, my least favorite might be Dr. Bashir, I presume, just because I'm still just not a fan of the genetic engineering plot yeah. reveal. Um, it, it the episode's just, fine. The episode's good. It's just I, I don't really like that story element when it got brought in. Yeah. Um, and so just for that reason alone. But if we're going for like like the reasons that you were picking 17, I would have to go with 17 too. Right, right, right. I so. hear you. Very good. Awesome. All right. Well, we jump into... Uh, this was part three, uh, so we'll be drop, jumping into our last uh, seven-pack of episodes. So we'll be wrapping up DS9 next week around. So, uh, Peter, thanks for joining us. Everyone, thanks for listening in. Peter, where do people find you Find you out there? Well, you can find me around the interwebs at Petrus Aquinas. I'm mostly active on Discord, um, where you can find me on the Grand Petoskey channel or the Secret Friends Unite channel. Um, you can also find me on ELH's Twitch and YouTube page where we are going to be starting a new RPG game with Star Trek Adventures using the brand new second edition rule set. Nice. Um, I have no idea who I'm playing yet because I have not decided, but oh you'll, you'll hear about it next time, I'm sure. Absolutely. And Good then you deal. can also find me behind the scenes on Starship Excelsior, which has a new episode as of last week. Oh my god! I gotta get I gotta get around tuning in on that. That's good. That's it's good a stuff. great yeah. show. I'm only in as a voice. Like, I'm a I'm a lead in a very very short episode, and then I'm background voices in like two. How so, exciting! Good but deal. I, I have transcription for the rest of them. That's my yeah. in the scenes. I love it. Good deal. Well, as always, you can find me over on Instagram and Threads at the C three T H E C E E T H R E E. Very very active on the Discord uh, for Secret Friends Unite. The USS Grand Petoskey, and of course our uh, United Trekkers of Michigan, which is a a Discord that April and I started up. We also are starting up a fun uh, Facebook group called Geeks and Sneaks, which is just about people who are passionate about not only geek culture, but alternate to that also just physical fitness, where we're going to talk about our journey of uh, getting in shape, playing pickleball, going for long walks, bike rides, things like that. 
Uh, yeah. So, uh, but that's it for this time around, friends. As always, thank you for joining us. I'm going to tell you that sharing is caring. And keep on trekking. Peace and long life. This podcast is part of the Secret Friends Unite podcasting network, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and podcast services around the galaxy, as well as video on our YouTube channel. You can support Secret Friends Unite by becoming a Patreon member, get bonus programs and more over at patreon.com slash secretfriendsunite. Join our Discord community for even more discussions on all things geek. For all the latest updates on Secret Friends Unite, make sure to follow us on threads at secret.friends.unite and visit secretfriendsunite.com. Find our merchandise at TeePublic and Redbubble. Thanks for listening and may the force live long and prosper.